all around Cheers, y'all Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this fine little radio program and show and podcast known internationally as Smokin' and Toastin'. It is, in fact, the world famous Smokin' and Toastin'. Hi, Mom. Welcome to show number 191. This program is all about craft beer, fine spirits, and hand-rolled cigars. My name is Cruz. My co-host is Ian, Adam on the Wheels of Steel, and uh, we're ready to have a good time. That's the whole crew. It really is. We have uh, Ian back in the studio. Last week you were in Tucson and uh, visiting your brother. I was. And uh, you uh, came to us from a... uh, what looked like a very interesting little cigar shop there. In, so, in yeah, Lounge. there's a couple interesting things about this particular cigar shop. First off, um, there's a door right by the patio that I was uh, sitting on, right. sitting outside. But that's kind of facing the street, and I, I assume most people don't walk into that door. So the door that you walk into uh, in this place walks directly into the humidor. Really? That's a outside. different configuration. For it's really shop. weird, yeah. considering, like I said, uh, I think I mentioned last week it was a whopping eight percent humidity there. <laughs> so when you walk in to yeah. the humidor, it's a very different environment. And, all of a and that humidifying equipment's got to work overtime in, yeah. in an area that dry. You <laughs> yeah. know, here in Houston, we can almost leave our humidors open most of the year. If if my <laughs> humidor, if if my Bovita packs are dried up and my humidor is not regulating right, it still stays at sixty uh, percent. You know? It's crazy, and it's that's crazy. inside. In fact, I'm wondering if sometimes the Bovita packs do more to keep the humidity down. <laughs> yeah, right. They're than actually to keep absorbing it up. more humidity. Uh, but uh, but you know, also in the winter when you're in uh, in a environment where you're running heat, your humidors will have a tendency to dry out because that, that heated air in your home is yeah. is always a lot drier. It's always so. a lot drier. Yeah. Well, even air conditioned uh, homes will do that too. Right. It, depending on exactly how you, now, now, if you use the old fashioned water cooler, you're in great shape. Yeah. <laughs> right. You just leave <laughs> your cigars those? out. We had one of those when I was a little kid. We'd turn on the water cooler and it would drip crap everywhere. Yeah. It was just big, mi- but the air the coming out of it was swamp. Cool. Swamp cooler is what they call them. It yeah, felt yeah. good to stand in front of, I will say that. Well, welcome to the show. As I said, it's number 191. We're halfway to 200. And we are brought to you by. B&B Butchers and Restaurant at 1814 Washington Ave in Houston, and in the shops at Clear Fork in Fort Worth. Bacon, 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 bacon. I have not been to B&B in a while. Yeah, it's been I too have long. To be, yeah, I have to go, yeah, get yeah, by yeah. there. Yeah, well, they are reopened like most of the uh, restaurants in Houston during COVID time. They've been allowed to reopen, but there are restrictions as to how full they, they right, can be. Right. And uh, there were a number, I didn't pull the story, but there have been a number of bars in Texas that have had their liquor license yanked saw that. for 30 days saw that, yes. uh, because they were ignoring the social distancing requirements for uh, being back in business. So I can't imagine, however, uh, being a bar owner or a bartender or whatever, what kind of nightmare it would be to be like, okay, you guys can all sit here and drink. Well, but stay away from each other. Well, but it's I don't think that bars are required to force people to distance because like you said that would be a really difficult thing That'd to do. Nightmare, they're in, yeah. they're encouraged to set up in such a way that it does. Right. But what they're not allowed to do is have more than 50% capacity or 25% right, right. depending on what your state is is uh, is issuing. Um they're they're required to not let that many people in the door. So if they let more people than that in the door, that's where they can get tagged. And did the uh, the TABC, Texas Alcoholic Beverage Commission, uh, tagged and took away, I think, a dozen uh, bar licenses mm. across the weekend oh, for 30 days. So And it's tough because you got, uh, like everyone else, you know, I want to go out and have a beer with friends. I mm-hmm. want to go out and hang out and, and stuff like that. Um but you can't really. Well, even yeah. in the studio here, we're six feet apart, yes, and yes. and that's one of the nice things about how the studio was laid out. We realized we can go back into the studio. Yes. We just have to, you know, we just have to be careful. And the quality's better than the Skype shows, and so yes, it yes. it makes some sense. But um, anyway, it's it's a it's a crazy world out there, continuing to be crazy. Some of my favorite bars are not even open yet. They're they're still you know still have paper on the windows. I'm wearing and stuff. my uh, new potato bar. Oh, uh, now is is Paul open? Is he? You know what? I haven't been there in a while. I think he's open. Uh, I think he's open at a very small capacity. But Paul has a unique kind of bar. Because he's got a big outside. Because his inside's so small, you just go in there and get a drink. No one hangs out in there anyway. So right. you go in there, you get a drink, and then you have this huge outdoor area. Right. 
and he's got these tables placed way out, you know, far from each other. So that's gonna that's got to make his situation specifically a little easier to manage that probably we've done several shows there and yes. we've always set up outside at the yeah. big table and it's it's a great place to do a show yeah it's, a and, it's an, and it's a nice little bar and the nice thing about it is you can just go if you bring a especially he's got that huge yard so even if even if the picnic tables are taken up just bring a a, a blanket you can yeah. set it up so, anywhere on the yeah. yard there's lots of shade and everything like it's got a great and place up music there. playing and great great yeah. stuff it, it's it, it's really a fun place to be uh okay on today's show in um there was a product that whiskey expert Chris Hart, who was our guest on the show last week, he was in the studio with me while you were yes. in Tucson. He mentioned a uh, a beer, wanting to know what we thought of it. And both of us kind of drew a blank because neither one of us had had it. I'd seen it, but I haven't tried it. I saw that you put it on the uh, dossier yes. for today. Well, interestingly enough, at first it didn't register to me what he was talking about. So I just said, no, I don't know anything about it. And then I realized... I've actually bought one of those, and it's sitting in my refrigerator. <laughs> so I brought it in today. It's the Montucky Cold Snack. And it's cheap. It like, Apparently. So I don't remember because cheap, cheap. I got it, you know, at uh, at the specs where I shop downtown. Um, they have that end aisle thing where you right. can pull, you know, like six different beers and put them in a carrier. And they pull them out and scan them individually when you check out. But I never pay attention to, you know what the individual price of each beer was yeah. when I'm doing that. So I don't remember how much it was, but according to Chris, it's pretty cheap. So it's kind of like the the Bush beer, yeah, shall we it was say? Like $6 or something like that for a six-pack? Well, uh, what we have is one of the 16-ounce cans, so it'll be interesting to see. And it's yeah, nice I, think and I think they're tall boys. Uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what this, uh, what this tastes like. <laughs> so that'll be one of the beers we'll be trying today. Also, I thought since we were kind of going very unfancy for the first one, that we go big fancy for the next two. So we're going to be trying from Zillico Beer Company, their Blossom Founder Aged Ale with Cherries. Nice. And then from Mad Tree Brewing Company in Cincinnati, the Axis Mundi, their American Super Stout aged in bourbon barrels with coffee and vanilla beans. That sounds delicious. So all of that sounds fun. And then sitting on Mr. Twirly Gig uh, Mr. Twirly is Gig. Uh, the uh, – and I'm – I'm pretty sure I'm pronouncing this wrong, and I think I even typed it wrong, but it's the Eximo rum. So we'll get more into that, and I'll take a closer look at the label when we get uh, when we get to that later. It says Eximo. But I think we'll have fun doing rum, and uh, and this one is uh, one I think you'll find very interesting. So. It looks like you already found it interesting. You know, that's the problem when I go. <laughs> See, so, so let me explain something. I will go into the store. At, uh, and I usually shop at the Specs in Midtown. And uh, I'll go in there, and so I'll stand in, like, the rum aisle, and I'll be scanning the aisles. And the guy always comes over to help me, and I'm like, no, I'm just – you can't really help me. I'm just looking for something I haven't had so I can bring it on the show and we can sample it. So I'm standing there for such a long time and comparing this and that and comparing price and reading the, the things and, and looking for new things because we've done a lot of the, of the major brands, and – so when I finally get one, I've thought about it so much right. that when I get home, you're like, "Huh? Did we already have I just, it? I just have to try it." Oh, you have to try yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I just, I just have to. So, uh, uh, very seldom does a bottle make it in here that I haven't, you know. So I'll cracked end the top up. Of. So, like, I interrupted you with that thought. Did I, did I already have it? I end up doing that, but I start thinking about it. Okay, I need to take this on the show. I need to take, it. and then I have this this run of things that we need to bring on the show and then by the time i get to it i've thought about it so much that i can't remember if i took it on the show or not <laughs> like i'm like well, you can always i remember thinking about taking it on the show you can always call me sometimes i remember sometimes i don't yeah, I've, yeah. I've, that's why i've done that before i sent you a message, hey have we had this <laughs> well and and our apologies if we repeated something but at least if we repeated something it was long enough ago that we don't remember it Nice. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, so at least you know maybe you maybe you heard that show. Maybe so. You I'm uh, so. I'm sitting here looking at the uh, uh, comments here. Yeah. And Trey Boring popped in, says, "How you doing today's guy? What's hey up, Trey, Trey, how you doing? We miss you. I uh, hope to see you again pretty soon. Also, I wanted to tell you just a little uh, something fun is when we were in um, Arizona, we went down to uh, down to Tombstone, and you know you walk the old street in Tombstone, and right. everything is completely commercialized and ridiculous. It's all like ridiculous saloon looking stuff, yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. But there's a great little cigar shop right there in Tombstone <laughs> on the old street. And the, the guy, I can't remember the guy's name, but he was perfect. Like when you walk Central in. Central Casting? When you walk in and you see this guy, 
that's the proprietor of the cigar shop. He is the guy that you expect to see. That's awesome. <laughs> like, right out of a movie, man. That's he had awesome. It. Yeah. And I don't think he was acting. I yeah. Think no, it was no. just him. He's found his place. But it was great. And we were wandering around, small little cigar shop. We were wandering around, bought a couple sticks. And then I looked over, and, uh, and my wife was buying a few sticks. And she goes, Hey, I'm buying a few of these for the Cigar for Warriors thing that they have over here. They had a little cigar for Warriors. So, so even she, in Tombstone, even in Arizona. Tombstone, she bought a few cigars, tossed them in a cigar for Warriors. So you That's were seen awesome. all the way out there, a thousand miles away, and so and so far. That's awesome, Trey. By the way, we are overdue to have you uh, on the show yes. and talk about cigar legalities and stuff. So please uh, text me at your convenience, and let's uh, let's set up a return engagement of. See, what I love about this show is we have. A f- we have like experts in certain fields. Trey yes. Boring is our legal expert Cigar when it comes to cigars. He, he's the guy that knows. He is part of Cigars for Warriors. He's also a part of Cigar Rights for America. Which is just and, Cray. Yeah. What? Cray. Cray. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> then we have our wine expert, Mark Burrell, who yes. comes on and schools us in wine. Oh, he's so fun. We have our whiskey expert, Chris Hart, who comes on and schools us in, in whiskey. Yes. And we are soon to add, I'm just going to do this as a tease, because it's actually gotten postponed. We were going to do it next week, but it's gotten postponed. We have a tequila expert coming on the show. Now, as great as some of the brand ambassadors are that we've had on, and as much as they know, I mean, some of them are amazingly Mm -hmm. knowledgeable, we can't have them as our official expert because they represent a, a particular yeah. brand. Sure. So, uh, so to find an expert, we've had to go to someone who uh, who will be completely impartial. I loved when we ran down the list that the supposed experts made last week of of whiskeys of the ten best whiskeys. Chris Hart only had one or another answer. It was only one of yes. two. It, it was, was either a hundred percent or. That's garbage. <laughs> no, there was no in between, and I love that about him. He's, not, you know, he'll he'll say that. So. Well, you know, uh, so one of the things I like about uh, some of the experts that we've had on, like Mark, and Chris, and uh, these guys, is they're not afraid to go into the you can actually afford this range, right? Exactly, and be very divisive about that, and say, okay, like at this price range, right? These are great, and these are garbage, you right? Know? Right, and and let's face it, a lot of experts, air quotes for yeah. those who are audio only, a lot of experts are kind of snobs about the thing. Well, it's that real into, easy you know? to be an expert about cigars when the only cigars you're buying are over twenty dollars. Sure, if you're smoking nothing but right? Padron Anniversarios, you're an expert yeah, on go ahead and- high end cigars. <laughs> that's right. But which which JR alternative would you smoke? That's you know right, that's right. that's a that's a thing. And by the way, I I, I got a little pack of JR alternatives uh, recently. I will uh, be reviewing one on a show very soon. So, um, you know, I think they're worth about, I think they cost me about $1.50 a stick. That's awesome. So, so how bad can it be to not at least get a five, right? <laughs> That's the way I look at right? it. Right. Uh, well, speaking of cigars, I'm uh, curious, Ian, if you smoked anything uh, interesting well, uh, lately. Speaking of budget friendly, yeah. uh, I walked into, um, into uh, Casa de Monte Cristo this morning. Uh, I, the, it's it's right around the corner. It's so easy. Those guys are so nice. And Steve uh, is awesome. Yeah, yeah. Steve's awesome, always awesome. When you run into Ken once in a while, he's mm-hmm. awesome. Ken's great. Uh, and I looked around, and he had a lot of the uh, he had all the Viejos in stock. By Ooh, the way, nice. Ooh, I wanted to buy Ooh. a bunch Ooh. of those. Um, but I decided, you know what? Today I'm going to go budget. Today I'm going to buy a small, inexpensive cigar. It's. Fifty cents over our lawnmower price. Mm. This cigar costs or forty cents. It's five dollars and forty cents. I chose a Southern Draw, Quick Draw, uh, Petite Corona, Connecticut. Now I love Southern Draw. I, I mean, do. they've got quality cigars. Yeah. So I'll be interested to see what their less expensive cigar uh, well, was like. And I haven't had any of their mm-hmm. less. They have a whole Quick Draw line, mm-hmm. and so I decided to try something like they have the Quick Draw uh, Madura and the Quick Draw Connecticut. And I thought, well, I'll try. The opposite of what I would normally grab. Okay, right. so you went Connecticut. So I went Connecticut this time, and um, and picked it up and thought, okay, it's Petite Corona, so it's a four and a half by forty four um, cigar. It's a really nice looking uh, little cigar. It's got some veins on it. Um, it's not, it's not like your super slick looking amazing cigar, but right. it's got some veins on it. Connecticut wrapper, Nicaraguan binder and filler, light brown, somewhat veiny wrapper, closed foot, pigtail at the head. Uh, a little bit soft in spots when you're feeling it, not mm-hmm. not super firm, and a couple soft spots, which 
which and sometimes you can think, okay, well, if it's got soft spots, it might burn uneven or it might you know right. act a little weird, something like that. But uh, more on that later. Uh, the pre-light sniff uh, with pleasant sweet spice, cinnamon, tea leaf, and slightly earthy notes coming through right off the nose. Sounds good. The pre-light draw I used a clip. <clears throat> it was effortless draw, slightly citrus, more of that tea leaf, sweet cappuccino. Uh, maybe a little espresso kind of uh, coffee flavors coming in, mm-hmm. and light cinnamon just on the aftertaste. Um, that was pretty nice. The initial light was a burst of campfire and green peppercorn, uh, with uh, with a with like lemon tea and poppy seed backing it up. It was this was a it had a lot of different things going on in it. I just want to point out that your tasting notes on cigars have gotten much more like in depth. Since we started the show. Well, when we started good, you'd say, hey, did you smoke a cigar? And I'd say, yeah, cigar good. So I've <laughs> well, gone at what, least. This is my point. You've <laughs> gone from there to sort of cigar snob uh, category. Uh, you're getting not just pepper, but green peppercorn. I, believe me, I love it, but I'm a cigar well, snob and, too. And so. yeah, the, the, the peppercorns have a different flavor and they hit your tongue in different places. Yes. You know, like black peppercorn's definitely up front. Mm-hmm. Uh, white peppercorn's way in the back. Green peppercorn's kind of in the middle there and has, okay. a, has a little bit different taste. So um, the the first third of this poppy seed tea leaf up front, followed by campfire and latte, because uh, it had a little creaminess to it. So I thought latte. It had the coffee, but but uh, definitely had the little creaminess. Finishing with white pepper and citrus, flaky ash. Perfect burn, though. Mm. Like it burned perfectly. So the soft spots the did soft not cause a problem. The soft spots were a little alarming at first, but it burned perfectly. That's great. The second third of this cigar, lemon pepper goodness moves up front. Uh, tea leaf still prominent. Poppy seed shifts to a sweet kind of cashew nuttiness. Latte with a kiss of marshmallow and pepper on the finish. It was very like interesting flavors going on. And this is one of those cigars that made me sit down and stop and really try to taste through it. Right. Uh, flaky ash, perfect burn. Nice. Absolutely perfect. I never tended this thing. Wow. The last third of this, surprising amounts of smoke were coming out of this. Like, it's, it's fun to blow uh, smoke rings with it and uh, stuff like that. Uh, the sweeter notes uh, moving forward on the last bit. Normally, uh, on a cigar like, like this, usually you expect the pepper and the strength to build up a little bit, but the sweet notes moved forward. As and you the pepper the last... and uh, citrus ramped up on the finish, but not really that big. It never got quite to full strength. I would say this is a medium strength cigar okay. um, overall, but maybe on a medium minus. Um, flaky ash, perfect burn. I smoked it down to, to my thumb just about. Perfect burn the entire time. Never tended it. Um, at $5.40. A great little cigar. It smoked a little fast is the only thing that I could even mm-hmm. uh, complain about. It, And that's not much of a complaint because it was right. uh, 40 <clears throat> minutes, something like that. Which isn't bad, yeah. No, not bad at all. For long as, it didn't, as long as smoking fast didn't cause it to burn too hot and no, give you no. harshness. And that, right? that was one of the things. It never built up. It never uh, hot boxed. Is that what we used mm-hmm. to call it? Mm-hmm. You know, It never did that, <laughs> that thing. Uh, it smoked well, stayed lit when I set it down. Uh, five dollars and forty cents. I give it a five and a half. Nice, easy, a little bit better than what you're paying for. Great for uh, for all around. Just sit around, smoke a cigar, and uh, and and a great little cigar that's inexpensive that you can actually really sit down and and dive into the flavors on. And let's be you know totally honest. During this time of economic turmoil, yeah. and some people getting their uh, you know their salaries cut or maybe their you know, maybe you kind of work for yourself. There's not as much business as there used to be. Finding good, inexpensive cigars can be a real big deal. Because yeah. this may not be the time where you can go and splurge on a box of Opus X or something. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. Well, I went with something relatively inexpensive, not quite as inexpensive as yours. Uh, and I I was actually a little surprised when I saw it. I expected it to be a dollar or two more. And it was the Brickhouse Maduro Robusto. Now, the Brickhouse... Yeah. Uh, before they came out with the Maduro, it got like one of the top cigars of yeah. the year in 2010. And uh, so then they released the Maduro, designed to be a little bit spicier mm-hmm. and a little bolder. So it was a really nice looking cigar. It had a pretty wrapper, a very well shaped cap. Um, it was wrapped in a Maduro Brazilian Arapica. Uh, let, let me try to get pronounce this right. It's the Arapica. Aripiraca. Aripiraca. Leaf. A R I P I R A C A. Arapirica 
leaf. I'm not super familiar with that strain of tobacco <laughs> right. or how to pronounce it. I thought I could do it, but uh, clearly I was uh, I was overestimating my ability. Anyway, uh, that's a Brazilian wrapper, Nicaraguan binder and fillers. Pre-light on it was leathery, a little bit of sweetness uh, mm-hmm. in the note. And I used a punch. I lit it up. The first pl- flavors were all earth and spice. The pepper was on the finish, so it wasn't just this immediate Nicaraguan pepper bomb, right. which was interesting. And as it smoked, I got uh, some real serious notes of cocoa. Mm-hmm. Uh, some nuttiness started to come through. There was a decent amount of complexity to the cigar. The construction wasn't bad, but it wasn't mm. quite as good as I would have liked. The burn was a little uneven, as you can probably see in the pictures. I don't know where we are in the pictures right now, but thing is, I had to touch this thing up and relight parts of the wrapper a number of times during oh, the smoke. Wow. You know that thing that it does where part of the wrapper will be burning, but the last, say, quarter or so of it is just out? Yeah. And so you have to go touch that up, and then maybe that burns faster than the rest because you've just lit it. You're constantly chasing it. You're constantly chasing the burn on the cigar. Um, It also felt a little bit underfilled, particularly once I had lit it and start smoking it. There were a couple of soft spots. It burned a little faster than I was expecting. You know, I've had some Robustos that'll be like an hour and a half smoke. Yeah, yeah. Uh, This one was uh, was not that. It burned a little faster. The... The speed of the burn wasn't enough to keep it from being enjoyable, but I just got the impression that it would have been more complex and more delicious. You would have gotten a better sense of these flavors that I was getting uh, if it had been filled a little tighter. And I know this is probably an inexpensive cigar in the Brick House line, just like the one that you were smoking from Southern Draw was a more inexpensive cigar. I know that the cigar factories will often use their lesser experienced rollers on what will ultimately right. be the cheaper cigars, right. and the ones that are going to retail for you know twelve dollars a stick plus, they're going to put their very best rollers on it because yes. you don't want to pay that kind of money for a cigar and then be a little disappointed. So um, the cigar was medium bodied. It felt a little stronger maybe than medium, but I honestly I think that may have been from the burn burning a little bit hot due to underfilling. It didn't become harsh, but I think that maybe again the burn just kept the flavor from being quite as nuanced as uh, it could have been. Overall, I enjoyed it. About $6 a stick, so just a little more expensive than the one that you had. I felt like it was good, but it didn't quite hold up to other cigars that I've had in the price range, so my price to quality is a 4.5. And it wasn't bad. I mean, I'm not saying I wouldn't even buy one again and smoke it. Maybe the the fill would be a little bit better on that, and I'd get a little more out of it and feel like it was totally worth it. But as you guys know, the price to quality, if we give something a five, yeah. we're saying you got exactly what you paid for. I didn't quite feel like I was smoking a cigar that was as good as some of the other $6 sticks right. that I've had. So that's why Now, this is one of those differences that we have with, uh, with the way we talk about cigars versus cigar review sites. Mm-hmm. Because we just talk about our experiences. Right. And we give this is our just what happened of, to me. Right. And what's funny about that is um, probably about a year ago, I think, I actually reviewed that same cigar and gave it, I believe, over five, probably a six. Right. Um, but I didn't have any burn issues with it. It burned beautiful, and I found it to be an absolute chocolate bomb. Well, see, this is there was lots of cocoa that yeah. I could get, but I just felt like if it had been filled just a little tighter, yeah. that I would have gotten more complexity. I would have experienced those flavors a little more fully, and I'd have probably come away saying this was a great six dollar cigar. Well, I can only hope, uh, uh, as it stands, that maybe you accidentally got one bummer. Well, yeah, because I've had pretty good. Pretty good experience with Brick House in general. I have so. as well, although this is the first time I've ever smoked the Robusto. But right. uh, but I, I've had good experience with them as well, and certainly they've you know been lauded in the cigar magazines and won some decent awards. So I'm not in any way saying that I don't like Brick House cigars. I, I I didn't even not like this one. I enjoyed it. Yeah, but it just wasn't quite as good as I think it could have been, and so. Well, and it can anyway. be distracting if you're trying to uh, if you're trying to think about the flavors and everything, but you have to keep relating. So that sure. that can be distracting. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, it's time for the Montucky Cold Snack. Coming right up. <laughs> that's going to be fun, I think, uh, and and hopefully informative. Uh, that's coming up. Plus, we do have drinking news today, and we're going to talk about my friends, thirty beers that changed America. 
So that should be a, a fun, awesome. a fun uh, list to go through. Uh, so it's smoking and toasting, and we will be right back. Thanks for hanging with us. <laughs> Thirty years of change America. That's someone who can't pare down their list. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome back, my friends. It's smoking and toasting. We are so glad to have you guys on board with us for show number one hundred and ninety-one. We are brought to you by the fine folks at B and B Restaurant, B and B Butchers and Restaurant, eighteen fourteen Washington Ave in Houston, and the shops at Clear Fork in Fort Worth. Uh, Ian, I know you're not like the world's hugest sports and NFL fan, but um, you may have heard of Ken the Hammer. Hamlin. Ken Hamlin was a former NFL safety. He was a Pro Bowl safety. He played for the Dallas Cowboys, also played for the Seattle Seahawks and the uh, Indianapolis Colts and the Baltimore Ravens over his career. A lot of athletes wind up moving around a lot this year. Anyway, uh, he was in the NFL for eight years, and he, in the middle of his career, he stopped at a gas station and decided to buy a cigar. And so, because he was making NFL money, uh, he bought the most expensive one they had in the humidor. Turned out it was a Padron 1964. Nice. Uh, so that cigar. was his first smoke, and he became a really passionate. Uh, I bet uh, he became a really passionate <laughs> cigar aficionado, and uh, he ended up at the Pro Cigar Festival in the Dominican Republic and met uh, uh, Manuel from La Aurora, and their their uh, whole relationship continued over the years, and he is now releasing. A cigar with La Aurora, which I just thought was an interesting nice. piece of news. Uh, the, uh, his lawyers, by the way, uh, initially dismissed the early suggestions for naming the cigar the Hammer or El Matillo, which means hammer in Spanish. Um, so he came up with the arrival, and that's what the cigar is called. So if you happen to be in your cigar shop and you see where the La Aurora stuff is, the arrival, the arrival and maybe check it out. I'll be on the lookout for one. Yeah, I'll check that maybe out. We can, uh, maybe we can smoke it. So, okay, I will confess that I don't know a lot about the Montucky Cold Snack, but we're about to know more. And I, I scanned the can. There's not a whole lot of information on the can, but they do say something about it being the unofficial beer of, is it Montana or Kentucky? I don't remember now. It says it uh, the unofficial beer of, I think it's right towards the top there. Um, there, it, it, there, it's in that uh, print right there. The unofficial beer of, of Montana. Of oh, Montana, is. okay. The unofficial beer of Montana. So I like that. We're we're like the unofficial show of America. That's I right. I mean, you can be unofficial for anything, you know. So um, I, I'm going to point out that when I cracked it open, I yeah. wasn't real impressed by the initial well, smell from the can. And Chris Hart wasn't necessarily saying this was great, but he he says he can drink it. So, um, and you know, he's got he's got pretty good taste when it comes to beer. Uh, although, was he saying that he would drink a bush beer? I wouldn't drink a bush beer. I I trust his tastes in uh, spirits. Yes, for sure. In beer, I we've had some questionable talks about beer. Yeah. Well, so. uh, uh, I'll just point out. Oh, you made it's, it does not have a good smell. You made a malt it's liquor face. A, is what you just did. It's got a funk to it that's not good. Not a good funk. You you just made a malt liquor face. That's exactly what you did. So, like, is it just me? Like, am I the only one? Well, smell? I'm not getting it. I'm not having nearly as strong a reaction as you did, but I do kind of it's smell what you're talking about. Bad. Well, let's see, let's something see. in Cause there because there's, there's some things that you smell and they're not that great, and then you taste them and they're just fine. So. That's like when I opened the can. That was the first thing that hit my nose, and I was like, ah. Mm. Is it poisonous? No, it reminds me of some of the flavors that we had during the light beer blind taste test where we were testing a lot of the sort of general market light beers like the Bud Light Lime and some of those. It reminds me a bit of that. This is lame. Yeah, it's not very good. This is this is lame. Um, It's refreshing. <sighs> I'll give it that. I'll, I'll yeah, I can't nice get past that, that thing. It's, it's a, Does this make us beer snobs that we don't like the Montucky Cold Snack? Uh, I think I'm not allowed to like this, or I think I'm allowed to not like this one is what I was trying to say. <laughs> um, but, yeah, and, 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 and you know, I'll I'll drink Lone Star. Yeah, oh, I like Lone Star, you know, actually, think, when I it comes to okay. there's that, a few, that There's a few kind, beers yeah. in that realm sure. of beerness that I can drink, and they're okay. Um, and it's not Miller Genuine. That stuff's bad have you ever had a pearl or yes this reminds me a bit of pearl beer yeah i mean here's the thing like there's almost no carbonation in this right 
So it really tastes like a cold flat. Like, have you ever opened? Have you ever opened like a a, a, a macro brew lager and then stuck it back in the fridge because you didn't have yes. time to drink it? Yes. Like if you got a Miller Light sitting in the fridge that's been there for like five or six hours, <laughs> and then and you, you come, come back, back to yeah, it. Totally. It's, it, it it reminds me of that. It's that smell that I was smelling is dissipating a little bit. Yeah. Or maybe I'm just getting used to. Maybe I'm getting nose blind. Your, your your palate is adjusting for you, trying to help. I mean, it, it's not like once you get past that smell thing that I had, it's not totally offensive. It really, I don't think it's good. It really doesn't say much on the can, except uh, that eight percent of their uh, proceeds are given back to local causes. They say recycle. Don't be a jerk. 16 ounces of refreshment. They do point out that it's a lager. 16 ounces of water is pretty refreshing. Uh, and they say proudly supporting L- uh, LGBTQ organizations and causes. So I think all those things are good, except for the fact that the beer isn't. <laughs> well, there is that. Um, I, You know, I got to be honest. Like, uh, Chris said he liked this as a, I'm going to mow the lawn or whatever. I'll right. take Lone Star yeah. um, over this. Any day. And I'd then, even take a bush beer over this. There's more flavor. More more beer flavor. Yeah. I mean, say. this this is not... I mean, and it could be, too, that it's just not a beer for me because, obviously, I don't... You know, lagers, for me, are not my favorite style, although I really like a lot of the craft lagers coming mm-hmm, out. Mm-hmm. Um, who makes this? Montucky, I think, is the name of the company. There's not much information on the can, and I probably should have gone on the internet. Maybe if Wiki Brian is with us, he can uh, he can research uh, Montucky Cold Snack for us. Brewed but, and bottled by Montucky Cold Snacks, Lacrosse, La Crosse, Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. So my question is this: If they're just called Montucky Cold Snacks, and this mm-hmm. is Montucky Cold Snack, that kind of sniffs to me like, and I haven't looked this up at all. But that kind of sniffs to me like, uh, like remember when we were looking at the bottles of, uh, of uh, malt liquor, and of course, Old E was brewed at Old E. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> Steel Reserved was brewed at Steel, Steel Reserve. Reserve. Yes, yes. And they had the exact same can and everything like yeah. that, and they were both obviously owned by um, AB by, or one of the big guys, right? Uh, the, uh, the other one, St. Louis. Oh, uh, yeah, and as a Bush. Oh, yeah. So, um. But anyway, uh, this reeks to me of that. This also, the can is ambiguous enough like that to where it's also like, remember the uh, remember the Walmart beer or beers like oh, that? Oh, yes, that when like- Walmart did their craft line for about five minutes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> remember. remember, we we looked for those. I we did. could I never did find them. We really wanted to try them. Well, uh, and you know, that reminds me, by the way, Trader Joe's has their own Yes. Line of craft and pseudo craft uh, beer. Now we should try some of those. I want to tell you, I've actually tried a couple of them. Yeah, and there, the couple of them are passable and drinkable. And I know that because I got a buddy of mine lives around the corner. He works at Trader Joe's. Okay, and you know we go over there. Uh, he gets off at like ten or eleven at night a lot of times. <laughs> so he's when like, you hey, could, come over for a beer, okay. right? So he's just brought some home from the, yeah. the shop, right? And uh, and I've tried a few, and some of them are. Meh, but some of them are actually, you know, drinkable. That and was my good. experience. I assume, tried them too. Uh, and Trader Joe's, as far as I can tell, is a pretty upstanding company. I assume that they probably get somebody they contract it, much I'm like sure. uh, yes. much like uh, BJ's would contract from uh, St. Arnold, things like right, that. Right. To, to yeah, it's their it's a uh, it, it's a you know house label, I suppose. Right, yeah. right. So they're contracting someone to do it. Uh, I don't think that that's a big name, but I suspect. I suspect a macro brew behind this. Well, when you use the word reeks, that's just not a word I'm you would use uh, of something that you're that you're really enjoying. Now, see, I went away from it for a minute and I smell it again, and there's it's man, it's got a a butt funk to it that well, I just I can't put, do. I put mine away, and I'm actually kind of glad. Yeah, I'm, I'm it's not. Gone. I'm not finishing mine. All right, so now we're going to move up to some good stuff, <laughs> or at least we hope it's good. I haven't tasted either of these. Chris beers. Hart, there's your review. You asked me about it last week. Yeah, there's yep, your review. Now you it. know. Uh, Zillico Beer Company's Blossom Founder Age Dale with cherries. You think we're moving up on the potential? We're quality going up scale? at least a rung <laughs> or seven. Uh, and then the uh, Mad Tree Brewing Company Axis Monday, which is. What they call an American super stout, aged in bourbon barrels with coffee and vanilla beans added. So we have all of that to look forward to. Uh, worry not, my friend. 
Awesome. All right, we'll be right back. And, uh, oh, we're going to be talking about um, the 30 beers that changed America. Or Good. a list of And we're going to start 30. our list of 60 beers that are cool in Texas. <laughs> You're saying the list is a bit long, is what you're saying. 30 beers. 30 beers that That's someone America. who just can't boil See, down there. I could come up with five beers that changed America. Well, that's, easily. you know what that is? That's that's a couple guys who sat down and said, oh, but what about this one? Oh, we oh, have to include those guys. All right, we'll get to that list when we return. <laughs> it's Smoking and Toasting, show number 191. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is Smoking and Toasting, show number 191. For those of you who actually uh, experience the show live, we go live on Facebook Live. And so any of the things that happen in between the segments, you're you're likely to hear what's going on. So in between the segment here, <clears throat> I asked our producer, Adam, who I'm going to say this in advance, has great taste in beer and spirits. Because, mm -hmm. you know, when he comes over and we hang out, he's always, always got great observations about stuff. So we asked Adam... What he thought of the Montucky cold snack, and Adam, you're gonna have to pull the mic up and tell us. Uh, but you surprised me a little bit. What uh, What's your take? Okay, thank you for your compliment. First of all, <laughs> <laughs> second of all, I don't have nearly as uh, as a you know palate as good of a palate as Ian does probably just because of his uh, descriptions. But I will say I didn't get the nose that Ian did. It actually smells a little sweet to me, and uh, not. Bad, just smells like beer, beer smell, and a little sweet. But then the flavor, uh, it at first I enjoyed the first initial sip and a couple more after, but then it left a weird, like, uh, I don't know if you eat those fake or like that artificial sweetener kind of stuff where oh, yeah, I it know leaves what you're talking that, about. It yep. leaves that nasty kind of thing in the back of your it's throat. It's like a metallic like, kind of taste almost. Yeah, it did leave that, but I will say the front and middle kind of. We're good. I enjoyed the first. All right. So, couple, so, so I mean, it's not a ringing endorsement, right. but he liked it a lot better yeah, than we it did. So, I wouldn't bash it the way y'all did. That's so out I mean. of <laughs> out of fairness, it's good to bring in another viewpoint. And clearly, Chris Hart thinks it's drinkable. So, if you included Chris in our panel of four. It'd be a 50-50 split. Do you suppose that Chris has scalded his taste buds with alcohol? <laughs> I think, well, you know his favorite. Uh, do, you suppose, do you suppose Chris Hart can't actually taste anything that's below 40%? I was going to say, you know his favorite <laughs> spirits, whether it's whiskey or rum, his favorites are all overproofed. Oh, I know. Yeah, th those are always the ones he likes the most. So, yeah, it's possible. <laughs> it's, it's entirely possible. Maybe that's why he insists on the hard pour. He's like, it'll release more flavor. Maybe he's trying to, well, I, gotta... I want to taste something. Is what he's saying. <laughs> I got, I got, you know, I got to wonder, and this is just in jest, of course, Chris. If you're listening to this, yeah, we love you, brother. Um, and if you're not, hey, hey, hey. Anyway, um, <laughs> I got to wonder because he likes such big, flavorful things, and he does. then, and then he likes my Tucky Cold this, Snacks, which <laughs> is, I mean, I don't know what percentage is this thing. Uh, I'm not sure it even says eight percent. Wow. No. No, no. no. Eight percent is giving back to local charities. Back to local causes. Yeah. Okay, I was gonna say there's no way. <laughs> that would be awesome, by the way. There's no way. If that were eight percent, that would be awesome. <laughs> That'd be flying well, off the shelf. Malt liquor's a higher uh, a higher not ABV. Not all of it. Yeah. Not all. It's usually about six percent though. Yeah. It's not huge. It's not you can get a lot of beers that are <laughs> Well, uh Ian, I, I'm gonna grab our next beer. Please because, do. Because we're at least in packaging, I think we're moving up slightly. If you want to uh, maybe show that one to the camera, we should have put that on Mr. Toilet Gig before, oh, we, we, should have before we started the segment there. But uh, this will be the Zillico. I and, do. Uh, can you put uh, Mr. Toilet Gig up there for a minute? The Zillico has this very friendly um, seafoam greenish mm -hmm. or bluish uh, uh, label on it with the big letter Z. And then some little squiggly lines going across that look like water, you know, like make it look like it, a Z in the in the water. It looks like the color scheme of my friend Dave and his wife Gwen's guest bathroom. That's what it looks like. <laughs> I mean, and I love their guest bathroom. Is, it's, it's, it's awesome. very, it's very modern, very modern, and very soothing. Yes, yeah, which soothing. which we may need after the Montucky cold We're gonna need a couple snack. more cups, by the way. I have some here, and I will pass them to you. Let's go uh, ahead. You want to get this started? While yeah, we're talking? Well, I, I tell you what, we'll do. You uh, take a look at that, and let me. Uh, you get that ready, and let's hear that pop. Ooh, that was nice. Oh yeah. See the the 
icing on the cake is the dropping of the cap. Yes. On the tabletop. <laughs> yes. I love that. Yeah. And when we were doing the shows in Skype, I was hoping, because the cap would drop all the way down to the floor, and I was hoping that the uh, the sound would be picked up. I don't know now, if Now, you did not mention, I might have poured a little heavy there, you did not mention not when, possible, you, my friend. when you talked about this uh, Zillico, you said with the cherries and everything else, you mm-hmm. did not mention that it was a... Uh, Sour ale, but this smells well, exactly. Does it say sour on the outside? I don't. I, I assumed it might be because it's brewed with cherries, and often that will be. Yeah. You, you don't. You don't get a lot of sweeter beers or or non sours that are brewed with cherries. True, but this smells exactly like what I wanted it to. Okay, that's good. That's so good. It says. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, Faudry Ale. Okay, it's, I it's a it's founder. A, I think founder. I think founder? that's the word founder, founder? but it's spelled uh, food, food with food with D R E on the end instead foundry. of D E R. Yeah, foundry, foundry ale. ale with cherries. Okay, cool. So it Floral, smells a little bit jammy, ambrosial. Yeah, ambrosial, ambrosial, okay, which means uh, with ambrosia. With <laughs> <laughs> right or. It's uh interesting. Five gallons of uh, Montmorency cherries, hundred uh, percent refermented in this bottle, unrefined, un, unfined, unfiltered, unpasteurized. Serve cold. Open with caution. In I this, did not open it with caution. So this <laughs> this um, on the nose this makes smells, me think of a farmhouse ale with a lot of cherries great to in it. In the yeah. room, yes, it does. It's but it's got a little bit of that funk. Uh, on the nose of a farmhouse ale, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, a little over ripeness. There's right. a little banana in the background. Right. When I, I smell love it. it on the nose, and this isn't. I don't like drink this style of beer a lot. With cherry on front, but yeah, the the over ripeness is. And then you can there. smell that tartness in there. You know how you can kind of like just by smelling something, you can smell how tart it's going to be. Ooh, wow! So up front, this is a reasonably standard. Farmhouse ale with a little bit of sour tartness to it. But when it finishes, it finishes with the cherry flavor like my favorite cherry pie. It's so good. Without being real sweet right, either. Right. And, you know, cherry pie obviously is a bit sweet, but the tartness kind of works, you know, take, in balance take to the sweetness. Take a sip of this, and I'm going to say a word. When you, when, okay. you, when you take this and you get right to the back of the palate on this, I'm going to say... Rhubarb. Yes, it's there, but it gets replaced by mm-hmm. that cherry uh, flavor that I'm talking about. This it's is got not that tart rhubarb stock kind of. This is not crunchiness cherry, right up yeah, front. This is not cherry like cherry jam or preserves. It doesn't have any of that sweetness to it. But the tart tartness of the cherry on the back. Is like my but favorite piece of cherry But you know when you get a pie. real good preserves and you have all the seeds in there, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then that seedy kind of right next to it, bitterness is right there, tartness is right there. This has a ton of that. I love this. I this think it's is, fantastic. I think a lot of people, my wife would absolutely not like this at all. Yeah, I don't think my wife um, would like it either. It's not, not really Because even palate. though all the flavors that it says in there are great, it's got a little more tart in it, uh, more, more like a sour... Uh, Ale kind of thing, and I absolutely love this. Like, I want to put this on my nipples, and they're not even sensitive. <laughs> it's it's good. I mean, it's it again, and and it's exactly what you want a bomber to be, which is a bottle that you could open with a friend or two over. You could all taste it and experience it together and talk about it. To me, it's much more that than it is. I'm going to have a beer tonight, and you open it. And drink it by yourself. No, you know no, I mean? this is not a. I'm going to sit down and slam this by myself. This is exactly that. This would go, like I like I mentioned earlier. If you had rhubarb pie for dessert, or a, a nice cherry pie, or even a peach pie, anything mm-hmm. that had that, I want pie crust with this. I think that's what's happening. Pie crust is, is exactly. Yeah. I want pie crust in a scoop of vanilla bean ice cream. Yeah, I mean that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on, let's let's call it what it is here. All right. Uh, so Thrillist is, is actually a pretty reputable uh, yeah. website. I mean, they're well. They do a lot of fun are generally stuff. Quite good. Yep. Um, they uh, they have this list put together by Matt Lynch and Andy Cries, um, which is the thirty beers that changed America. So I thought we'd go through a few of these 
and then we'll pick up a few of them in the next segment. So it says in the beginning of this, it says every beer has the potential to have a huge impact, but the beers on this, this list go further than just helping you to get the courage to hit on somebody way out of your league. These American beers have had a huge impact on beer itself and in turn our pot-bellied nation. From trendsetters to game changers, micro to macro, here are 30 beers that changed America. Each sip is a little bit of beer history. And then there's an editor's note. They say, we opted with this list to include only beers that are currently brewed. With respect to John Wagner's Lager, Ballantine, Red Dog, and whatever beers the revolutionaries were drinking uh, while planning a war in historic bars. Oh, my gosh. You wouldn't remember be able Red Dog? To find- I do remember Red Dog. Wow. Although, I'm guessing that the Red Dog they're referring to may be something that the Red Dog we're referring to was actually named after. No, those are Red Dog beer. Yeah. Oh, I know. I've I've had. Red I think Dog. there was a malt liquor too named Red may Dog have been. for a while or something. But there was a Red Dog beer in like the eighties, early nineties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there may have been an older one anyway. But um, the first beer on the list, I will co- totally applaud them for um, for having on the list. As Chris Hart would say, hundred percent, Yangling Lager. All right, very good. They say what it changed. Uh, Yingling has survived a lot, survived a lot, including the Civil War and Prohibition. Think about that. Yeah. It's old enough that it survived both of those things. Uh, it's the oldest brewery in America. Five years later, it's still, uh, I'm sorry, five generations five later. Five generations. It's still in the family. Uh, it helped shape the very fabric of Pennsylvania through industry and influence. It's America's first example of a beer dynasty and part of America's blood. And by the way, you can't buy it in Texas, uh-uh. which bums me out. You can go to Louisiana. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And buy it. Yes. And uh, I know when we had a, a little family reunion in Florida a couple of summers ago, some of the guys went out and came back, because you can buy it in Florida, came back with cases of it. Well, I We had point, Yingling for days. I want to point out, Yingling Lager is a good beer. It is. Um, and, like, in Texas, we drink Lone Star. Right. Lone uh, Star is kind of the Yingling But it's not as good as Yingling. Yeah, and I Yingling is just a better beer. And Lone Star, I'm not trying to knock Lone Star. Don't get me wrong, but yeah. Yingling is just a better beer. I lived in Philadelphia for a while yeah. and uh, really got a great taste for They also make one Yingling. of the best porters out there. And they have great little, if you're in the Philadelphia airport, there's a little Yingling uh, uh, bar nice. there. That's a great thing if you're, if you're uh, you know, changing planes, you got some time to kill. Look for the Yingling If bar. anybody totally on here is listening from Philadelphia area, mm. What's with the beware of aggressive drivers signs on the road? That's really <laughs> that weird. Is, that's, a, that's a Pennsylvania thing. That's very bizarre. <clears throat> it's, a very, it's a Pennsylvania thing. There may be fewer of those there now since I don't live there anymore. <laughs> but beyond that, um, next beer on the list, by the way, Paps Blue Ribbon. First brewed in 1844. They say uh, hipsters love craft anything, eating honey produced by bees in their neighborhood, and yada, yada, yada. And for a while, they were champions of craft beer. But craft beer is expensive, and it's hard to make a living working part-time at a record store that only sells original 7-inchers. So they turned to PBR, a beer whose low price point and high irony level fit the hipster mentality perfect. The resurgence, they say, which can, of course, be traced to a Portland dive bar, uh, took PBR out of a slump, and sales have skyrocketed. Good for PBR. Um, eh. Yeah. I, 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 I would rather mm-hmm. buy the Lone Star than the PBR. I agree. It's a better beer. Yes, again, it's a, better a better beer. beer. Mm-hmm. Uh, but PBR is at least hip in that ironic sort I of will way. say PBR is drinkable if it's ice cold, mm-hmm. but a lot of beers are. A lot of beers that I don't, and I'm putting air quotes up there, that I don't really like. I would rather have a PBR than a Montucky Cold Snack. Yes. Yes. So there you go. Was not a fan of that. <clears throat> next on the lip, is, uh, l- next on the lip, uh, I saw the word hop and, <laughs> and it made me uh, mispronounce. Next on the list is Schlitz, first brewed in 1858. Um, in 1911, it was the first beer to be distributed in brown bottles, shielding the suds uh, from harmful sunlight and ensuring better taste. Um, in case you couldn't tell by the overwhelming number of brown bottles in the case at your local store, uh, that idea kind of caught that, Yeah, that kind of yeah. stuck. Next, Except for Heineken. Heineken did not get yeah, that. No, they, they didn't get the memo, did they? No, they did not get the memo. <laughs> Next on the list is Iron City Beer. Uh, they say it was first brewed in 1861. While it inarguably changed the physiques of generations of Pennsylvanians in the century <laughs> between its debut in the 1960s, Iron City's national influence didn't become apparent until... Uh, 1962 had nothing to do with the beer inside the can. 
Uh, it had to do with the noise, apparently, that the beer made when you opened it. Uh, that first happened in 1962 when Iron City fired the first shot in a quick and brutal war against the Church Key by becoming the first brewery ever to offer the pull tab can. Uh, so this is why yeah. they're on the list, Iron City. Yep. Iron City. And, and you know... Yep. I see lights got to be on there somewhere. Uh, I would guess probably so. <laughs> uh, Coors is on the list. First brewed in 1873. It wasn't the first beer to use the aluminum can. Uh, Hawaii's Primo beat them to the punch a year earlier in 1958. But Coors did pioneer the idea of the seamless, recyclable can. And they instituted the Cash for Cans program. And back in the day, uh, before craft beer became a thing, I knew plenty of people who lived in Texas who would make treks to Colorado just say, so they could come home with a trunk full of Coors. Were the cans cold activated then? No, no. That, that, was, that was an innovation that is much more recent. That's after they got rid of the flavor. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> next on the list is Budweiser. You know, I, I guess it has to be on the list because it did, no, it did change so American beer, right? So respect to Budweiser for their history. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, not respect to Budweiser for their business practices. Uh, they say it could be argued, and, and they're right, that no other American beer has had an impact greater than Budweiser's. They say it's basically the Ford Motor Company of beer. Yes. That's a good way to put it. Yes, and, and Budweiser's marketing campaign, the Clydesdales, <laughs> the whole... The whole visual of Budweiser is pretty amazing and yeah. pretty attractive. Well, and they've been masters at marketing for generations. Like, who didn't want, when you were right. just learning to drink a bunch of beer, who didn't want one of those giant Budweiser mirrors and with the Clydesdales on right. it and everything? And so many of the best ad campaigns have, you know, for beer, before the most recent ones, which I think have not been that good, but some of them have been great for Bud or Bud Light. Remember the... Uh, um, the uh, what's up, uh, you know. <laughs> I mean, I, I know that's like really stupid now, but at the time it that's was pretty awesome. Funny. It was awesome. The uh, yes, I am. Remember that campaign? Yeah. Uh, so they've had a lot of great campaigns. They did the Bud Bowl, remember, which was the animated bottles that would play at the halftime yeah, of the Super yeah. Bowl. Um, so yeah, they've they've been marketing geniuses. And well, and again, it's 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 not their history. Uh, like their history is mighty and amazing, and we owe a lot of. Uh, beer uh, knowledge and the way they made their beer consistent and everything like that. We actually owe that to some of those big companies like Coors and Budweiser. It's the marketing uh, is amazing. I mean, who didn't want to have one of those Budweiser uh, uh, pool table lights yes, yes, next to exactly. their next to their dogs playing exactly. pool tapestry? Spuds, remember Spuds McKenzie? <laughs> Spuds McKenzie? I had a Spuds McKenzie towel. <laughs> you know they took the penis off Spud McKenzie. They actually used a girl they dog. They used a girl dog for Spuds, <laughs> for yes. For Spuds, because they didn't, want the, this. They didn't want the this. penis there. All right, we'll come back to more of this list later, but I will just say this final thing about uh, about Bud Weiser and Anheuser-Busch, that you can't, hate on them, you can't hate on them too hard because they will probably soon own your favorite beer. Everything. Yeah, they'll own everything. Bruce Stark says, bartended a local bar in uh, the early 70s, sold more PBR than everything else combined. I, I believe yeah. it. I believe it. All all right, we're going to take a break. We'll come back for more of this list, and we're going to come back for some rum. And I will have Ian read the label and tell us exactly what this rum is all about, since you're closer to the bottle. Uh, so we'll come back for uh, some of the rum, and uh, we still have some American Super Stout to go on the program as well. Plus, we'll close out this list. It's Smoking and Toast, and we'll be right back. Feel like it needs that in there just, just to add that funky feel. Welcome back. It's smoking and toasting. Yes, we are so glad to be on show number one hundred and ninety-one. We are brought to you by uh, the fine folks at B and B Butchers and Restaurant, eighteen fourteen Washington Ave in Houston, and in the shops at Clear Fork in Fort Worth. Ian's about to open a bottle of rum. That was nice. That was nice. Yeah, that was pretty Once good, again, the high tech sound effects continue here on uh, Smoking and Toasting. While he's pouring, I'm going to go through a few more of these beers that are on the list of the 30 beers that changed America. Uh, up next is Natty Bo, National Bohemian. Now, Ian, I lived in the Washington, D.C., Baltimore area for a while, and Natty Bo, based in Baltimore, is 
for lack of a better way to describe it, it's kind of like the Lone Star of Baltimore. That one I've never tried. And it's it's not as good as Yangling, not as good as Lone Star, but it's still worth washing down a cold one if you're at the corner bar in, in Baltimore somewhere. The reason I think, though, that they're on this list is because they forever altered the beer landscape in 1943 when they became the first brewer to make their beer available in six packs. Oh. So that was their one of the great things about Natty Bow though is the huge uh lighted Natty Bow sign which you can see when driving through Baltimore. And it just I don't know, it's it's got their little icon guy, the guy with the handlebar mustache and the one eye, but it just makes you I don't know, it just makes you feel welcome. <laughs> it's, it's it's a wonderful thing. Narragansett uh beer is on this, first brewed in eighteen ninety, but they're on the list because in nineteen forty four they became a corporate sponsor for the Boston Red Sox and the Boston Braves, which included uh telecasts uh, on this newfangled invention called television. And Ooh. considering that televised sports is now probably one of the biggest ways to sell beer to the uh public and uh Represents about 57% of U.S. economic uh, activity. Uh, it's proved to be a pretty astute business move. Next on the list, first brewed in 1896, da-da-da, Anchor Steam. Nice. Anchor Steam. Great beer. Um, you know, you, you applaud and call out Anchor for still producing steam beer, but what what does that even mean? Their, their impact is on craft beer itself. They essentially started the craft beer world. Yeah. Miller Light is next on the list, first brewed in 1974, uh, and they say, just look at the world before Miller Light and now after. In 1974, every single aspect of American beer changed, from composition to advertising to frat parties. The impact of light beer and Miller can't be under- understated. Uh, their prediction in 2027 is spelled L I T E. Well, like it's because it's, it's not light. You know, I, I wonder if hold on a spell it. I wonder if. Light beer instead of L I G H T mm-hmm. couldn't be used because legally it's not any lighter than anything else because it's not right. But that could be it could have so been they called thing. it light. Yeah, could have been, been. I, I don't, don't know. know. Maybe it's weird. It's weird. Maybe the, they just thought that'd be cool. The article predicts, by the way, that in, that in 2027, craft light beer will become a thing. It's already a little bit of a thing. I mean, I've got I've got a six pack of uh, slightly mighty in my refrigerator now. But it's not called light beer. It's called it's right. a locale and it's, it's locale and local locale craft beer. All right, one more for the moment. Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, uh, first brewed in 1980. They didn't realize at Sierra Nevada they were about to spawn a whole new style of beer back when they decided to do uh, a pale ale that was really hop heavy. Uh, but boy, did they! They put in an unheard of at the time amount of Cascade hops, and yeah. the rest, as they say, uh, is history. It's what started. The sort of fascination with hops that still totally exists today. Not a lot of pale ales were out there for a long time. Oh no! Was, uh, and and the IPAs that were on the Rolling scene, Rolling Rock. Yeah, well, the IPAs was that an were extra on the pale. scene. Yeah, the IPAs that were on the scene were more like Bass. Yeah, which is a much different style of IPA than what we've sort of become accustomed to an IPA. Being that's because bass is not that hop forward. Uh-uh. So anyway, very interesting stuff. We'll come back to the list, but it's rum time. Ian, you have poured uh, some of the rum. Now I'm going to have to ask you to read uh, from the bottle and tell us a little bit about this Eximo rum. I will read from the bottle. Rum aged ten years. Facundo, a collection of exceptional. Facundo, that's the. I think that's how you pronounce it. Facundo, a collection of exceptional rums inspired by our founder Don Facundo. Uh, Don Facundo Bacardi Masso. That's a long name. Sorry, I wasn't prepared for that. (laughs) (laughs) That's all right. The legacy of generations handcrafted for today's rum connoisseur by the world's finest artisans. Mm -hmm. Uh, A mystery written in a sweet cane and fine oak. Unforgettable smoothness revealed by uh, 10 years of artful aging. Deep gold nuances of honey, caramel, lingering traces of vanilla. Savor boldly. And watch the story unfold. I have to say, yeah, a lot of times when you read it on there, they flower it up a little bit. After my first sip of this, I think they kind of nailed it. They're kind of right on the money, aren't they? And, yeah. And I don't think that this is one of the most... Hmm. I don't think this is one of the most interesting rums we've had on the show. Because it is exactly what they said on the bottle, but it is really really good mm-hmm. like it does one thing really well and it does that 
The honey is huge. The vanilla is huge. Right, and and it really hits in exactly the order that the, that you read it off the bottle. You get the honey, honey, caramel, and then you get the uh, caramel, and then, and then the vanilla on the finish. One of the things that I find most interesting about this rum is that on the nose, it feels like it's going to have more heat. Yeah, and when you drink it, it's it's much more. You know, Chris Hart pointed out that the word smooth isn't always a good word when you're talking smooth. about spirits, but I kind of like. I kind of like the smoothness here. Well, let's let's change it's the word smooth. It's easy to drink. This has a silkiness to it. There you go. On the palate, it there has you a go. silkiness and a little butteriness to it. But it's funny because after the uh, swallow, mm -hmm. that butteriness goes away. And is replaced by the vanilla. And is replaced by the vanilla. And, and I don't know if you've ever tasted vanilla like as a... Like without sweetener in it. Oh yes, absolutely. Right, but it's that kind of vanilla, not yes. a real sweetened vanilla. No, you're absolutely right. If you take a bottle of vanilla extract, right, and just put a couple of drops on a spoon and taste it, that's what this. That's what the vanilla here is like. Right, because because the sweetness happens up front. It doesn't finish super sweet, mm -hmm. but it does finish with a lot of vanilla. It's very right. pleasant. The rum sweetness, the, the sugar cane sweetness, if you will, is definitely up front. What I noticed uh, because you were so. Um, you know, eloquent, eloquent in noticing that I had already opened the bottle and tried some. Oh, oh, astute, yes, yeah, astute. There you go. What what I noticed though, as I had some of this the other evening, is that it was also a rum that I enjoyed more and more as the evening went on. Now, not because I was, you know, getting tipsy, but because flavor wise, it felt like it just kept kind of like expanding, and subsequent uh, sips were even more enjoyable than the first one. So it's one of those that I, I that once you get it on, on your palate. palate, it really, really starts to work. I think it's fantastic. Uh, I think it's very good. Uh, I Again, it's very kind of, I, I want to say one-dimensional, but it's got the those, those components that we talked about. Um, and it doesn't really have much more than that, but it's really good at what it does. So this is a one-trick pony that's really good. It's also a lot sweeter than a lot of rums we've had on here. Yes, that's a true. A lot sweeter. That's um, true. So I would say if you want something after dinner. Oh, yes, it'd be a perfect know, after dinner. And rum. this would go amazing with a very peppery cigar. I can mm -hmm. see that happening mm -hmm. right away with something uh, Nicaraguan, mm -hmm. possibly made by A.J. Fernandez. Maybe like an Enclave, yeah. uh, Toro, Maduro. Yeah, I mean, like something with a lot of pepper to it, I think that this would tame that pepper down and they would... Really, really do a good job. They would, they would mesh well together. Yeah, I'm for uh, it. I like it. Right, I think I'm, that's a good rum. I'm, I'm glad that I'm glad that you liked it. I think that's, uh, I think that's good. And, As, and and for all you people seeking my approval, yes. <laughs> well, it's important. They're they are legion. So, uh, <laughs> right. so it's good to, uh, it's good to know. Let me go through just a few more of these beers, and then we'll uh, take a break. Come back with a little, uh, a little uh, American super stout. Can't wait. All right. Uh, Samuel Adams, Boston Lager. So glad they are on the list. 100%. And they should. 100%. Uh, we haven't said that's garbage yet. I'm not yet a golden-throated pitch guy. Yeah. <laughs> Chances are, uh, uh, the article says, you think that Sam Adams is run by the Illuminati. Uh, fact <laughs> is, a Jim Cook and company just came out thumping their chest like they were the biggest brewery in the world. And they've always kind of done it that way. Even when um, they were small. And that, led, uh, that led the path for the likes of you know Lagunitas and Sierra Nevada and every other bigger name craft brewery to do the same. You know Sam Adams because Sam Adams made it a point that you would know them. Yeah, and, and we talked about it briefly uh, a couple shows ago about how Sam Adams would educate people on their commercials. Like they would right. show you what hops was like. Right. They the, would talk to you about how about much the components right, of beer and, and how much foam should be at the top of your beer when you pour it. Like and, all those yeah, things. All those yeah. things. Yeah. And they've been okay. Now I'm going to challenge people to do this. Sam Adams, uh, their Sam Adams Boston Lager is their flagship brand. Lately, most of their gains in the beer market have been from producing craft seltzer and other things. Very quietly. Sam Adams has made some wonderful um, summer shandies and IPAs, things that haven't gotten a lot of attention, and they're really good beers. I encourage you to go find them. When uh, I see new Sam Adams 
beers, mm-hmm. I will almost always try them. I'm not a big fan of the Summer Shandy style. Yeah, it's, it's not, not my really favorite style thing. of beer, but I, I do like theirs. But I will I will try most Sam Adam things just because it's so good. That's Sam 76. Oh, my God. That's great. That's a great And beer. that's a lower calorie Let's talk beer. about that. Let's talk. That's a... Is, is that a pale ale or a lager? I can't I, remember. I don't remember, but I know it's a lower calorie beer. But man, I think it's an ale. That is a great yeah, beer. It really is. And I will also say that Sam Adams is really great about releasing mix packs. You can find all kinds of Samuel Adams 12 pack mix packs. Yeah, with a bunch and of it's different a great way to and, sample yeah. a lot of their different uh, flavors and styles. They also make a really wonderful porter. I don't know if also, you've had the Sam Adams. Kudos board. to them for keeping their quality and their integrity. Absolutely. Absolutely. Way up all the time. And by the way, they are now merged with Dogfish Head. Yes. Both both uh, breweries are keeping their own separate identity, but they're able to cross pollinate and do some things together. That's, and that's it's, it's all that's exciting. It's all really pretty exciting. Widmer Hefeweizen is on uh, the list, Kurt and Bobby Wid- Widmer. Uh, they call them the two OGs of the Portland, Oregon craft scene. Uh, I haven't th- tr- tried it. I've seen it. Uh, they ran into a dilemma early on. They were getting bigger and were asked to create a third beer uh, to go with the alt beer and the Wiesen beer that they had. Trouble was, they only had two fermenters. So the solution, they just decided not to filter the Wiesen beer and serve it cloudy. And uh, just like that, the hazy American-style Hefeweizen was born. And virtually every other yes. brewery now has yes. a hazier Hefeweizen in their uh, uh, in in their lineup. Brooklyn Lager, established in 1988. Yes. Uh, it was, uh, they say, a very influential microbrew, as your dad calls them. And uh, they were, you know, they were, I think, in the New York, New Jersey area of the East Coast, they were the first really prominent, like Boston Beer Company Sam Adams was in the Boston area, and like Yangling was in the Philadelphia area. These guys were the ones that kind of took over New York in the early days yeah. of the craft explosion. So that's a pretty uh, that's a pretty important uh, uh, pretty important role to play. Uh, the Deschutes Black Butte Porter makes the list. That's a great um, beer. As does. And this so deserves to be here. So I'm I'm beginning to think maybe it should be a 30 beer list. Yeah, I'm starting to begrudgingly agree. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Goose Island Bourbon County Stout. Oh, how can it not be on here? Yes, this changed. It created everything. an entire style of beer. Mm-hmm. It really did. Now that I love. Now the next beer. This is a beer my wife loves. I don't really like it, but I do believe it should be on this list. And it's Blue Moon Belgian White. I agree. I'm not a fan of it, flavor wise. I, I, I think if you're going to go Belgian white, Celis, mm-hmm. Celis is great. The uh, white that, but, uh, the white that uh, Saint Arnold makes is is yes, really good. Yes, but white noise. I think is white the noise, thing. right? Yep. But that being said, Blue Moon really pushed it and really got people trying different beers. Well, that's the so thing. So much respect for as that. As a as a more macro brew, um, as a macro craft, I guess you could yeah. call it, uh, and, a, and a very early one, it started showing up in bars everywhere, and you started seeing people walking around with the beer with, as my friend mm. Dave would say, produce in it. Yep. Because they would put a slice I of orange. I did that when it first came yeah. out. I tried yeah. it. Yeah. I enjoyed yeah. a few. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not a big fan of the style in general. And if I'm going to have that style, as you mentioned, there are other ones I think are better. I want to pause you and challenge you. Do you still have some of this? Uh... Just a little bit, yes. Okay. The rum? No, the... Um... Oh, the, uh, the the yes, I do have a little bit of the, the blossom. The Zillico okay, blossom. so remember you said it had that farmhouse hail mm-hmm. uh, funk overripeness? Yes. Okay, after the rum, yes. now take a sip of that, and it tastes... Should I take another sip of the rum? You don't necessarily have to. Okay. But it's going to taste... Like, check this out. This is... Wow. Now it's a sour farmhouse ale. Particularly, yes, yes, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. That it, overripe banana in the it background expels is a little, huge. It expels a little of the funk, but that, that overripeness comes right to the front. Right to the front. It's interesting how that rum changed this beer so much. Which is one of the most and fun things. And in a good way, but not necessarily in a better way, just in a, now it's Just different. in a different it's way. Good, yes. It's one of the most fun things actually about what we do, is experiencing <laughs> how one thing can, uh, you know, can impact and influence another. Flavor. Flavor. It's all about flavor. And that's why this next beer also belongs on the list, Lagunitas IPA. Yep. Still a go-to for a lot of people. They weren't the first American brewery to brew an IPA. They weren't even the first one in California. But when they launched their IPA on shelves in 1995, uh, it could have kicked off the 
hops arms yeah. race when everybody started going uh, going for big hops. I can't enjoy one with a cigar because it obliterates every oh, yeah, cigar yeah, I've ever not tried. Good with cigars. But boy, is it a good beer if you're just having an IPA. So it's interesting because that IPA was one of the first that was that big. They just went one bigger on everything, mm-hmm. and it made everyone go, "Oh." We'll oh. go one bigger than that. Well, yeah, yeah, and then it, it, <laughs> the hops exactly arms right. race is exactly right. Uh, Victory Prima Pilsner makes the list. This is a very good yeah, Pilsner. I, uh, Victory Victory's, makes great beers. They're from Downingtown, and Pennsylvania, so really good. had plenty of their beers when I lived in the Philadelphia area. Uh, they say Pilsners are deceptively simple in their ingredients, but insanely difficult to master in execution. And uh, they're very Victory finicky. was one of the one of the first ones to really and their do flavors it. are delicate, so it's real easy to mess it up. I think you're going to agree with me on this one this should absolutely be on the list as chris hart would say 100 percent stone arrogant bastard yes <laughs> what a great beer this and that is. was the response to the lagunita stone going okay here yeah well the original pale here's, put stone on the, the map hammer. but it was arrogant bastard that really set their destiny into motion the label says and i love this you're you not, are not worthy. worthy you gotta love that <laughs> it's the best uh so that's definitely worth it then uh the new belgium la folle f-o-l-i-e yeah. la folle uh that is um something that uh well New Belgium already had this following building, mm-hmm. uh, that, uh, thanks to Fat Tire, uh, but they, um, in 1997, did the unthinkable, they say, by releasing this farmhouse ale. Uh, yeah. th- there really wasn't anything like that released to no. most people back at that time. Now there are breweries that specialize in only that. That you know? hit the market like Black Sabbath's first album. They were like, what the hell is this? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> where, where did these guys come from? Let me hear that again. Uh, Dogfish Head Worldwide Stout, first brewed in 1999. Yeah, buddy. Uh, at nearly 20%. Yeah. It was named the strongest beer in the world when it was first brewed. Uh, Which set off an arms yeah. race for strongest That's beer. That's exactly what it did. Uh, 16 years later, the uh, the arms race is still raging, basically. Uh, but that one's fun. Oscar Blue's Dale's Pale Ale Great makes the list. Beer. Uh, strictly speaking, Dale's wasn't the first craft beer to be widely available in cans, but it was the first to do so and then become really popular. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons they're on here, and because... It is a great beer. Now, I have not had this next one. It's the Three Floyds Dark Lord. I don't think I've had Dark Lord either. Uh, They say it's now synonymous with the most legendary release party in craft beer. Uh, This Russian imperial stout brewed with coffee uh, started with just a handful of experimental barrels, but additions over the years uh, have included metal bands, impossibly rare guest taps, unfathomable unfathomably long lines and uh, bottle limits and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so we had a little a bit thing. of that here in uh, in Texas for a while with Real Ale's Coffee Porter. Every time yes. it came out, they had a Coffee Porter release party. And, and I went to a few of those, and they were a lot of fun. Let me ask you this. Um, St. Arnold's um, uh, limited release, the... Um, uh, the Bishop's Barrel? The Bishop's, the, no, not the Bishop's Barrel, but the other one. The Divine uh, Reserve. Divine Reserve. Is that still a thing when it comes out the way – because I know when it when it came out a few years back, like even around the time we started this show, if there was a Divine Reserve release, people would be camped outside the liquor store before it opened, think, and it would be gone in a couple of hours. I think they're putting out more Divine Reserve than they had before. That uh, beer is I'm so not, good. I might be wrong. we got to get those guys on but, the show. But, yeah, we do. Totally. We really do. Uh, the Alchemist, Hedy Topper, is on the list. Yeah. Uh, that certainly has uh, the reputation – to belong there, as does Russian River's Pliny the Younger, which was the precursor to uh, Pliny the Elder. Uh, and then uh, Line and Kugel's uh, Summer Shandy, yeah. uh, which is one of the more well-known shandies, I think, that are out there. Uh, I love this next one. It's still a go-to beer for me. The Founders All Day IPA yeah, Session that's Beer. that's a great one. That's, that's on the list. When you got a company like Founders that says, you know what, we can do this too. Yeah. Treehouse Julius is a beer I'm not familiar with. I have Ooh. to, I have to say, but no idea. Uh, they say Hetty Topper may have kicked off the New England IPA craze uh, by slowly brewing a, a brewing a cult around Hetty Topper. But Treehouse in Charlton, Massachusetts, took the idea and amped it up to insane levels. So I guess they were one of the first people to go super juicy on uh, right. on IPAs. So uh, Athletic Brewing Company's Run Wild IPA, which is a uh, low ABV, low calorie, low carb designed, you know, for you to have a beer after your 
work out you know, that there doesn't are, there taste like groups, a Michelob Ultra. There are groups of runners mm-hmm. that run from bar to bar to bar mm-hmm. and have beers at each bar. That's a thing that they do oh, at wow. night. I don't know how, how well I would run those I last couple of joking. bars. <laughs> that's what they do. They run from bar to bar to bar and have well, beers. Ian, I can tell you, uh, that's the list. That's the, We went through 30. Jeez. And I would say pretty much all of those deserve to be on there. I could maybe name a few more. Uh, th- that's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> so maybe our list wouldn't have been shorter. Maybe it would have been <laughs> maybe longer. Maybe it would have been 45 beers. Where's the list you wanted to do? 60 great Texas craft brews? <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do the list. That'll be fun. 60 great <laughs> beers from Texas. <laughs> all right, we're going to take a break. We'll be back for our final uh, uh, segment of show, uh, Smoking to Toast and Show number 191. In our final segment, we will taste Mad Tree Brewing Company's Axis Mundi. It's an amazing... American Super Stout, aged in bourbon barrels with coffee and vanilla beans. Plus, we have not done drinking news, so we'll do drinking news in the final segment. Uh, Stand by, because the only thing I'll tell you is, don't try this at home. Drinking news (laughs) is next on Smoking and Toasting. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. It is Smoking and Toasting at show number 191, brought to you by B&B Butchers and Restaurant, 1814 uh, Washington Ave in Houston and in the shops at Clear Fork in Fort Worth. <coughs> Ian, I challenge you, my friend, to stop me from doing what I'm about to do, but there's only one way to stop me. Cruz, stop it. No, that won't work. Oh. You've got to actually come up with a song. Until then, you'll get drinking news. Drinking news. <laughs> now it's time for drinking news. Drinking news. You you know you want to stop this. Okay, yes. Okay, yes. all right. So, yeah. No. You're, you're the musician in the I see in the what's group. happening here. Yeah, yeah. No pressure. Just, you know, I'll keep doing that until you uh, record us a little drinking news intro. Uh, it's time for drinking news, which is a, uh, a, a time on the show where we bring you uh, an article that has appeared somewhere in the news. So we're not making it up. I can't guarantee that the people... Didn't make it up there, but we need a beer to drink during this news. So what what's going to happen is you're going to start the news. I'm going to open this beer. I'm going to pour it. All right, fair enough. Then, this is the after super the stop. news happens. All right. Well, you do need to be drinking. That's the whole concept behind yes. drinking news. Is it's so, a story that should be interesting to hear while you're drinking. So hold the news story for just a second because right. I'm about to open the uh, Trunk Series Axis Mundi Coffee and Vanilla Bourbon Barrel Aged. Uh, super stout. Yeah, American super I stout. I like everything about that. I like bourbon, I, say, I like barrel, you, you, and I like You aged. took a pause, and it was almost like for refer- for reverence it's, that it's you took a, a pause. <laughs> I'll read the rest of this once we actually get into okay. it, but, but before we start. Yes. Not bad for a super stout. Not bad. Uh, all right, so while Ian's pouring that, I'll just point out the drinking news is not always about drinking, although it may be sometimes. The idea is just that... Should be a fun news story to hear and experience while you were drinking, or at least interesting. If not fun, at least interesting. That is what we can hope. Ian, I'm I'm thinking you're going to be a fan of this Axis Mundi. I really am. Well, it, it, I mean, I could see you pouring of, it. I could see there's this There's a lot just, of things about it that I like already. Yes. Oh, it does look good, doesn't it? Um, let's, let's get into drinking news, then we'll talk about it. All beer. right. Um, interestingly enough, j- between the last segment and this final one, uh, Adam, our producer, had to bounce out and go to uh, the men's room, mm-hmm. which is a good thing, especially once I pass along the story I'm about to pass along, because we're doing a little drinking here on the show. A man in China. I, you know what? That's almost as good as stories that start with <laughs> a Florida man. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> which, Actually, by the way, did you know there's a whole website dedicated to that? Florida man? News stories that start with a Florida man. Oh, dude. Here's I have all websites. I haven't told you this, but on next week's show, we're going to be enjoying or or tasting. I think we'll enjoy it. A a double IPA from Cigar City Brewing in Tampa. Oh yeah. And the name of the beer is Florida Man. Nice. I'm not kidding you. I'm not kidding you. That'll be on next week's show. I I didn't get it until after I'd already set the lineup for this week's show, or I probably would have brought one this week. Uh, but no, I'm I'm really excited about that. All right. So this this story actually doesn't start by saying a man from China. It starts with the words "You're in trouble." 
as in urine. urine. As in one word or two? One word. Oh. <laughs> urine. Trouble. In an incident that redefines sleeping it off, a Chinese man's bladder burst when he unknowingly held his pee for 18 hours after binging on booze. He was a 40-year-old man identified only as Mr. Who, H-U, reportedly fell asleep, uh, <clears throat> uh, passed out, after downing 10 bottles of beer during a heavy drinking session the night prior without heeding nature's call once. Why would he not do that? After experiencing searing abdominal pains, he reported to the People's Hospital in, Z uh, in Zhejiang, eastern China, where a CT scan revealed that his bladder was torn in three places. The pee-induced pain was so intense that he was unable to lie flat, and he failed to relieve himself despite several attempts. So I don't know why you would do that. That's why I said don't try this at home. Like, if you're going to uh, – and I'll admit, if I'm out someplace and I'm having a few beers, I'll go to the men's room like five times. Like, I just – it just always happens. When you got to go, you got to go. You got you to gotta go. You can't, you can't hold it in. Never – the lesson here, my friends, is – Never ignore nature's call. Yes. But the man's bladder exploded. Oh. Uh, I don't know why I, I find know. that mildly funny. I don't even know what to say. <laughs> For right. 18 hours, For 18 though, hours. That's like you'd figure, like, I don't know about you, but after my first beer, I usually am like, hmm. Many years ago. Is that nature calling me? Yes. Many years ago when I was in uh, broadcast radio, I was on a radio station in Panama City, Florida. Back to being a Florida man, uh, and a Florida man, and on a there radio were station. there were these huge nightclubs along the beach that did a lot of business with the radio station, and so they would do like special theme nights on their slower slower nights, and we would come out and promote it. And we did this promotion. I'm not making this up. With one of the clubs down there, it was Monday night bladder bust night, and the idea was you would be admitted into the bar by a certain time, and then they would close the door. And when they closed the door, they began serving free beer. Now, clearly, they went with the cheapest keg beer they could find yes, for this. Yes, yes. But the beer was free until someone had to pee. They put, like, police tape across the bathroom doors. <laughs> and the peer pressure not to break the tape was intense. Because everybody, if you broke the tape too early, everybody's, oh, man, now i got to start paying for my beers. Uh, clearly, that is simultaneously... The best and worst idea. Oh, it, ever. it is. It clearly it is the worst. I can tell you, it was a disaster. <laughs> People were peeing in cans and corners. It was. It was. It was not a good situation. Oh and then the God. person that finally, uh, you know, broke the tape got practically everyone bullied. Everyone hated him. Yeah, yeah. Every, everyone hated him. This is not the type of thing. I only mention it because I believe it's been long enough that the statute of limitations has now expired. Uh, there's no way you could do that legally today. Oh, no. There's no way. No, no, It no. probably wasn't legal then. Probably not. But uh, that was But that was in night. the 80s before safety was invented. <laughs> Did, when was safety invented, <laughs> actually? Was, I'm not completely sometime sure. Sometime before the 80s. Ian, I can't or believe- sometime after the 80s. You haven't taken a drink of this yet. Uh, I have been waiting. It smells great. Oh, man. Tell, talk to me about what you're getting on the nose. Uh, on the nose, I get a lot of the vanilla bean and the bourbon. Mm -hmm. Yes. Like- very bourbony Maybe. right off the nose, and a little bit of the. Uh, We've had a number of these bourbon oak. barrel uh, stouts. I think this one has a little more vanilla on the nose than I'm used to. Yeah, this is very vanilla forward, but also mm -hmm. has a lot of the oak forward too. Like you can right. almost like it's making my mouth water with the oak astringency kind of thing going on. Ooh, I have a feeling you're gonna really like this. I believe so too. That is one of the best stouts I've had in a long time. Does the bottle say what the ABV is on this? Man, it just keeps going on my palate, mm, too. Mm. Oh, and the vanilla. Oh, and the caramel. The vanilla and the caramel. Burnt and the caramel. The coffee and the burnt caramel. Oh, and the coffee backing it up. The burnt caramel is almost like, uh, what is the dessert where they bring out the torch? and The and, creme brulee. Yeah, the creme brulee. Yeah, yeah. very much Ooh, like that. Oh, man. Ancient believe Siberians it. believe there was a world tree called the Axis Mundi, which uh, connected different worlds through its roots and branches. Mm -hmm. Within this bottle is undeniable proof of a link discovered between the worlds of brewing and distilling. Repurposed American oak uh, bourbon barrels are filled with American super stout, which 
digs down to its ancestral roots and is tucked away until the proper time to be unearthed, releasing flavors as rich as as rich and dark as the soil in which the world tree thrives. I love this story. Yeah, that's, it's a great story. Whoever wrote that, kudos to them because that's fun. Yeah, it is fun. It's not just you know, you know, a bunch of. Uh, so I don't know what. Uh, okay, so backing up, barrel aged trunk series. When you scrape away the bark of a tree, you start to discover its age and character. Ring after ring, nature reveals the kind of magnificence that only the passage of time can bring. Savior, uh, savor this beer and enjoy the many layers of mad tree. Mm. And then it says, I live off a motto that says, a motto that says, yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery. That was by Vanilla Ice. <laughs> Now I know yes, Justin, it has a vanilla ice. I know photo. a Justin Timberlake song where he says, "Yesterday's history, tomorrow's a mystery," or or maybe it's in in the opposite order. I don't remember, but Guilty. I don't know. I don't know the Vanilla Ice. I only know one Vanilla Guilty Ice pleasure. song. That Justified album is real good. Oh, Justin Timberlake. Yeah, I think he's a genius. Did, real good, dude. Man, and of then the, the woods. thing. What about that? What about that uh, live show that he did on? Uh, Oh, with Chris Stapleton? Yeah. At the American Country Music Holy Award? Crap. Where he does Drink You Away and Tennessee Whiskey? Oh, it's, it's, look it up on YouTube, kids. So good. Because it's so freaking good. He's very talented. Ian, I'm pouring you a little bit more of this rum because I'd like for you to take a taste of the American Super Stout, the Axis Mundi, and then a taste of the rum. And so, then go back and tell me Mad what you get. Mad Tree Brewing Company. Uh, so one of my buddies looked on here and says, "Did they explain super stout? They don't explain." I think that I think they have stout. a stout. I think that's their normal, like their regular that's just their stout. stout. Yeah, I and don't their know lineup is called super, super stout. Is a uh, I believe that's an the actual case. thing, or if it's yeah. something. No, like I don't that. think it's a. Uh, I don't think it's a. A description so much as it is what they call their. They're stout. I think they call American super stout. So interesting enough, the uh, s- the beer doesn't change the rum at all. Mm-hmm. Like almost negligible. So now go back to the beer. Because you've got some major vanilla going in both places. It doesn't have a percentage on here either. I was looking around for that. I'm not seeing it. Um. Nope. And it says bottled on and then it's just blank. So it was bottled. <laughs> bottled at some point. <laughs> It should just have the infinity symbol, right? Yeah. <laughs> Bottled That's on, That's whenever. <laughs> All right, so go back to the uh, to the stout and tell me what you get. Oh, it turns it into a vanilla coffee liqueur. Yeah, it becomes more coffee forward, doesn't yes. it? Yes. Yeah. Mm. Wow, that's really good. Mm-hmm. Like it, it's almost Irish coffee tasting mm-hmm. at that point. It's a perfect way to describe. Which it. is really weird because rum. And right, you wouldn't put it's, rum in an Irish coffee. Thing. But when you go back to the beer, it's interesting how those interact. So I am a big fan of this. This is a fantastic Mad Tree Brewing Company. Where is that from? It's, uh, I believe, I... Cincinnati, Ohio. Cincinnati, Good Ohio. job. Thank you. You yep. Not yep. much else to do in Ohio that I know of. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> having been there, I would agree. There you go. Uh, you can eat some chili and. and uh, watch the Bengals. Watch the Bengals and, and uh, enjoy an action. Bengals Monday. have cool. Uh, cool. They do have colors, cool helmets, yeah. yes, cool and, helmets. And, and, and cool colors, yes. Um, this is probably my favorite stout we've had on the show in a while. This is so good. I really there's like a, it. There's an underlying chocolatiness to this. Mm-hmm. The mocha uh, kind of flavors from the malt in there. The malt is so caramel, burnt caramel, uh, that the mochas, you almost have to taste through the malt, and then after a few flavors you start getting that, Right, chocolatey mm-hmm. part of the malt. Well, I will say, but it's a very powdery chocolatey part right. of the malt. It's really good. When it comes to the finish on this beer, I will paraphrase Celine Dion: "The cocoa will go on and on." Uh, well, just, not to one up is, your Celine Dion, but uh, yeah, I, I, I will always. Love you. I just <laughs> Dolly Parton you. You did totally, and and I have to say, I have such mad respect for you for saying that you Dolly Parton me instead of saying that you Whitney Houston me. <laughs> Not that I have any issues with Whitney. I love 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 me some Whitney Houston, but that song was a Dolly Parton song before it was a Whitney Houston song. So, and Dolly Parton is awesome. Let's just let's just throw that out there. Um, so, what do you think uh, as as stouts go? Would you put this in your 
Oh, this in, in, in this shoots up in the top ten right yeah. there. Like yeah. this is really, really, really good. Yeah. Axis Mundi, ladies and gentlemen. Axis Mundi. If you can find this from Mad Tree Brewing in Cincinnati, in Cincinnati Ohio. Ohio. Yeah. You guys rock this one. Well, this has been fun. Uh we've had uh, we've had some very different things on the show today. We had the Montucky Cold Snack. We had the Zillico, which is the much blossom. much different. Uh, yeah, the Zillico Blossom, much different from uh, most of the other farmhouse and and tart ales that we've had. And then this, uh, lastly, this Axis Mundi has been just absolutely terrific. I take it the comments are weighing in. <laughs> Bruce Sp- Bruce Stark said Dolly Parton for the win. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, I'll take it. And I'm enjoying the hell out of this rum. I can tell you that. I It's one of those things that just gets better and better the more I drink it. So... I uh, want to thank everybody for being a part of the show today. We were going to do a special show on tequila next week. That's going to be postponed a little bit, but we promise you we're going to be bringing in a new tequila expert that will wow you because she knows her tequila. I can't wait. So that's going to be exciting. That's coming up. Plus, in a couple of weeks, uh, we have a special guest uh, from Florida Kanye. Uh We already know our, our buddy, Hamilton. Hamilton, who's He's been on so the show. Great. Gosh, okay, well, one awesome. of his big bosses is coming in to talk right. Nice. So it's going to be a nice. great show. And when we had him on here the last time, we did mm-hmm. a phone interview with uh, with one of the guys. Yes, and with one was... of the guys in the Dominican Republic, yes, I think. Yes, yes. Uh, so, yeah, so one of his big national bosses is coming in, rum expert to talk rum with us. I, and, I, have, to, I have to tell you, remember, I, I had that bottle of... Florida Kanye twenty five. Yes, it's gone now. Yeah, that was that twenty five is just spectacular. <laughs> it's so isn't good, it? isn't it? So yeah. Hamilton, if you're listening, uh, Ian's twenty five is gone. My bottle of twenty five is is yeah. is no longer working, and my bottle is gone as well. It wasn't the twenty five, but I I, 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 <laughs> I have just I have no more Florida Kanye rum in my bar. That's the problem. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, it's good stuff. Um, thanks to uh, Adam on the Wheels of Steel. Thanks again to Chris Hart, our guest uh, from last week. Man, he was and, awesome. And thanks to Alan Denny, who is just a, a great friend of the show and is always popping up. I think he commented about 30 times last week. Whenever Chris Hart would say something, uh, he would just jump on the, <laughs> uh, the comments and just absolutely uh, absolutely dog him. So uh, thanks to all of you. Uh, my buddy Steve, thank you for listening and watching the show. And have a wonderful week, ladies and gentlemen. We will be back with you next week for more smoking and toasting and uh cheers cheers to you sir clink